And so this part is going to be done by Louise. So you can go ahead and take that away. Thank you, Daphne. So we thought that we start the story of Brownfields, uh, at least the EPA uh, Brownfields program. Uh, we started our first application. I uh, want our staff people thought that it was a good way of like going uh, for developing programs. And this was way back in 2014. Around like 2015, uh, I met Charles Ray from PPM Consultants and he explained to me that the best way to for us to apply for this program, one is so it was an economic development program, which means that it was going to have to be under my umbrella within the council, and that we also will be the best, uh, more competitive if we apply as a coalition. So after several conversations, uh, we all, all, all of us that have been in the region for several years know the struggles or the, of the OVP uh, US 441 corridor. Uh, it's a very, very long corridor. It used to be one of the main two first uh, through uh, Metro Orlando, connecting the tourists and the, uh, to the city and the parks. But because of the expressway and changes, it has been in a steady decline for several years. So Charles and I had kind of a brainstorming when we're trying to apply the, well, what will be the best uh, areas to actually go in. And that's how we started. Uh, Charles kind of knew that Shakinia had started, uh, had tried to apply to the city of Apopka. Uh, we have been working uh, with Tom with the city of Longwood. So we said, well, you know, who we work with really well before? Uh, we always work really well with the city of Kissimmee, it's in Corridor. And then we also learned about the city of Eustis, which gave us like that, that stop in Lake County, which like kind of like all the transitional part of the corridor. So we we're very happy. It was not easy. Uh, we applied at least about four times, a lot of times. And, uh, but finally it came to us. Uh, I received a call from Brian in June and it was one of the happiest calls. I still, ha I still have the recording in my, in my phone. <laughs> Because it was definitely after five long years, we were able to go in. And it was really good because the thing with the coalitions is that you want to make sure that people stick with you. That's a difficult thing because as a regional agency, the cities are putting a trust on us to be able to get the job done. So that was the difficulty we had. Every time we had to come and explain, no, we were not successful because this is a very competitive grant. But now it's here. So our primary goal right now is to try to revitalize uh, OVT US 441 and, uh, and the cities that actually are part of the coalition. Uh, because we're a council though, and we take to eight counties, we're also taking uh, some of the program like outside of the coalition. And we're probably right now, the way we're working out is that uh, we want, because the idea is to have more coalitions come like come up in the next couple of years. We, our idea here is not just like we want a grant and that's it. No, our idea is to develop a real Brownfields program. And we're one of the few areas in the state of Florida that did not have one. And that definitely was a missing piece in our toolbox. So we, we're taking it mostly, the way we conversations we had is that at this point, uh, we have a good budget to do the phase one assessments and those will be the ones that we'll do outside and just leave the phase two which are more intensive and more expensive with our coalition cities because they're all partners. So what we want here is to be able to address what we think properties that could be either contaminated or could actually have the pretty specific people to think that they may have some contamination. That's what they're not getting developed. Those of us that uh, know OBT well and have driven through it know that uh, the, a lot of the uses in the area are either manufacturing uses, all manufacturing uses, or very high commercial test uses, whether it's dry cleaners or we have like car repair shops. That, that's pretty much all, all car lots. That's pretty much what we had in OBT right now. And that has definitely not allowed for the, for the corridor to redevelop 
the best way it can do it. So we're trying to do that uh, with your help because we definitely want to not only engage with our coalition cities, but we want to be able to engage with a community. Brown, the Brownfields program has a very strong community component. And equity is a very important part of that. When you join uh, this uh, committee, you are speaking on behalf of your communities. And you will be the person that your ambassadors is what I said, you know, if you know you all are connected either to the business community, you might be connected to the church or to other service organizations, and you might be able to learn and keep like uh, your ears and your eyes wide open to actually see what, what will be a good side for us to actually go into. And when we actually go into the community, we were consultants from Orlando. That's the reality. And for, so it's much more effective to have somebody who actually lives in the community speak on behalf of the program. What we're noticing too, it's also very important to talk about, it, there's a big difference between what we're trying to do to the federal program versus what the state was trying to do with their program. In the old days, what you have to do to be able to receive funding from the state was to actually de designate your property as a brownfield. Within us, we're not designating anything as a brownfield at all. This is just an opportunity to provide services. And I was in Kissimmee, I met Bob in Kissimmee uh, at an event we had uh, two weeks ago. So he and I went, uh, went down there and I was telling the story of like a dry cleaner uh, that we had targeted as one of the priority sites uh, for this grant. But it turned out that maybe because of the whole fear of the term brownfield, uh, the owner decided not to participate in the program. Find out later from the city's economic development office that they had paid a consultant uh, $7,000 to do their own assessment when it will have been done through us for free. So that's pretty much the argument here. For the next three years, hopefully, we're gonna be, have the resources to assist members of the community to redevelop their properties. And we know that a lot of the cities have big plans for their downtown areas. I, I wrote the GCB Medical District study. So I know that the medical district is like a cornerstone of the city's economic development. We're working with the city of Apopka right now. And we know that there's also a lot of things happening in Apopka. Longwood is changing all their codes to actually uh, make the city more walkable. And the same with Eustis. Eustis is going to Renaissance too and have some pivotal sites that they really need uh, to redevelop. So the idea here is how do we tell the story? We'll tell the story through, uh, through you. And making sure that, yeah, this is not a program we're trying to do anything to your property by designating as a brownfield. No, we're here to provide good services as we should because we're a we're statewide agency. I think, can you go to the next slide? I think I had something else. Okay, so for a while, and I, I, I'm, I'm gonna have to brag here because, uh, you know, we, after we learned from Brian that uh, it was like May 31st that we were actually selected, we actually worked really hard. I had, was just going on vacation in June <laughs> because this was after my first vacation before COVID, after COVID. So basically we worked really hard in August and September to set up a framework to make sure that our Brownfields program is going to be successful. There's always that pressure when you're a rookie and it's your first time to prove that uh, you are definitely on top of it. So after we selected our consultant, uh, PPM in September, uh, be and before that, like our team had already been working on the uh, development of the, of the bag and development of different plans and programs and also the media kit. We spent like hours talking to coalition members during that time and listening to what their needs were. Right now, uh, we've been, the program started in October, so that's probably about six months now. 
And uh, we have completed at this point uh, six phase one assessments. Uh, we have another three right now in progress and every, every day I get like a new report. <laughs> so it's really difficult. This changes like every day. Uh, and we have two phase two assessments right now in process. And I believe they, at least one of them has been approved. So that's a total of 14 sites. So I think we're doing really well. And uh, I heard, you know, this is not a competition, but I always like to talk. Uh, there were other two, there was another coalition within the region and there's also uh, one of the cities and I don't think they're as, as advanced as we are. And it's because of the hard work that uh, Daphne, Ken and Edwin uh, put to the past couple of months to make sure that this program is successful and that also we, I, we thankfully we were able to pick what I think who, who was who's going to be the right consultant. So, did I have any other slides? Yes. We go down. I think there so, is this one and another one. Yeah, we establish uh, to make this easier on everybody, and that's the conversation. Like, there's a lot of moving pieces. We. We have become very, uh, I wouldn't say strict, but very formalized when it comes to where we do our, our brownfields communications. So if our community member or our property owner wants to go to a program, there are two things that they need to fill out. One is the brownfields program assessment application. This is just general information about the property. It's very important that we know where the property is located, especially in all communities, the addresses sometimes get commingled and it's very difficult to ascertain where they're located. But most importantly, we need the site access form. EPM cannot go into any property unless they have an approval from the owner. And this is very important. At the same time, we started, uh, we're starting a ranging orientation meeting and presentations with both site owners and staff from the different cities. Uh, this is uh, being led by Daphne and Charles Ray uh, from PPM, because we definitely, again, because of our experience now, we had a couple of meetings, but there seems to be a lot of confusion about the program. So this is the site, like I said, Erin and I were meeting. Um, we had a one of the commissioners in Kissimmee had a business round table. And it was really a good opportunity to just talk about the program and the advantages it was gonna bring to, uh, to the community. And I had realtors come back to me and they knew what a phase one and a phase two were. So it was a really, we hope to be able to go to events like that. A lot of you are very involved in the community. So if you have any community events that you think could use a speaker, definitely, even like talking to a Rotary Club, for example, we are definitely either, Daphne Pro with the main contact for that, but I can do it too. We can have that chat briefly because again, what we want is to prepare our community to be the best it can be. Can you go to the next slide? Okay, uh, Charles, is there anything you wanted to add before we go into questions? No, uh, uh, just from the standpoint of, uh, and I, I just sent the inquiry from uh, City of uh, Eustace who had been just getting things together um, of several sites. And then uh, for Ryan's purpose, um, we're well ahead of any schedule that I've been in, in, involved in recently of the number of sites that are being teed up, uh, both uh, in the OBT corridor, but also uh, sites that are uh, local governments that are outside of the, the corridor. And as Louise mentioned, um, the OBT corridor and uh, the original 
uh, coalition partners have priority, but from the standpoint of uh, a general threshold of 70% in the first 18 months, meaning 7% of the grant being obligated or expended, and uh, the first 18 months is more than a realistic uh, for the planning council as things are moving along. It's um, just been exciting to, to see the activity and the partners uh, stepping up to make it happen. Uh, again, uh, and I should have probably uh, mentioned that before. A lot of the progress we've made has been because of our partners uh, within the city, the different cities. Uh, each of our coalition cities has a contact person uh, for city of Apopka, that's Shaquini Jackson. And I think she was here uh, for the city of Eustis is uh, Mr. Tom Carino. Uh, then for the city of Kissimmee is Samaya Singleton. And for the city of Longwood is Tom Kruger. These are very important points of contact and probably you all each know, you know about them in your cities because they're the ones that are actually letting us push, giving us the head up toward the sites and helping with a lot of the processing. So that is really important. Then on the other hand, it's like I always said, our priority is definitely the corridor and the coalition cities. We are a regional agency, and but that's the reason why I bought Bob. Uh, I invited Bob Cambry because Bob, we have served in a couple of communities. I don't know he's a citizen of Apopka, but Bob kind of represents the council in a way. So at some point we'll be adding people representing the council who will probably be able to provide you a regional perspective, uh, provide us with a regional perspective for the program. Any questions? Yes, Robert, you're muted. Uh, I hate when I do that. Um, a few questions actually. Um, are we subject to uh, sunshine laws? As a uh, as a committee, that's a good question for like a lawyer. I think that on our side, that's, on our side, we will be complying with sunshine in the way that uh, we will be recording the meetings and providing minutes and making sure that a lot of them are actually published. Uh, you're all appointed. You don't have any power, so I. I I think it becomes really murky. I can definitely ask our lawyer and see what his opinion is. I, we had this same situation with my set strategic media a couple of years ago. And they determined that, yeah, you were subjected to sunshine. Um, so what I don't like about the sunshine laws is that it will prevent uh, all of you from communicating with each other outside of a meeting like this one. I don't think that that's the best approach what we're trying to do. And I don't know, um, the sunshine law, so that uh, Brian is not from, from our state, that's, that's, that's a Florida thing. I'm not sure, uh, Brian, how have, uh, have, how have the other uh, coalitions dealt with that in your experience? Yeah, well, um... That's a good question, and I can't speak to the Florida requirements. Uh, usually, what we ask of our grantees is just to be open about the process. Um, and of course, any what we call deliverables, like the phase ones you've already mentioned, uh, we want those to be available if people uh, are interested in, the, in them or need them. Um, but as far as Florida requirements, I, I don't really feel like I can, I can speak to that. I have to follow them, Jerry, yeah. lawyer, just to and, make and, sure. And Luis, uh, just from the standpoint of uh, the back uh, committee, it's more of a, um, and, and at this time, an informational uh, meeting where there are no um, voting decisions are being made. And that was the, the, the whole thing about the Sunshine Law is that we're, there were 
going to be voting in the decisions made. But on the safe side, um, you know, the fact that you, you're recording all your uh, meetings, if anyone ever wanted to know what took place at a meeting, uh, they will have access to that. And again, we are a state agency, so we have to be, we have a duty to the public. And, mm -hmm. and my, 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 my opinion is that uh, none of you have any power to make a decision, extra judicial issue, I think it's called. That's how they call for this planning and zoning, extra, extra something. Uh, you don't have, uh, you don't have that. It, it's not like you have a power to point anything. I know when, when Bob goes into the planning and zoning, you're making a recommendation for approval or not approval or specific zoning. Here, we're not going to ask you to approve a brownfield, not approve a brownfield. So uh, that's your, there's suddenly, uh, you are severely limited. In, uh, in your role, uh, but I will, to be on the safe side, I will ask our, uh, I make sure I'll, I'll ask our lawyer and refer that to the committee in a couple of weeks, so you can, so you know. I appreciate that. We just uh, went over that as uh, chair of the Affordable Housing Advisory Committee. I mean, I've been through this before with uh, PAB and, and SACS and so forth, but uh, our deputy city uh, attorney came in and uh, gave a primer on the sunshine laws and was very, uh, very, you know, very pointed about, you know, communication between members when it's not in the context of a meeting. And the, the thing that I want to be careful there is it's not, it's not you as a council that is held um, responsible in a legal sense. It's us individually. Okay. Um, as individuals. So, so I just want to make sure, um, you okay. know, so everything's above board. No, so it might be a way to like, no, uh, I, I do see your concerns there definitely. So it's a situation <laughs> that maybe if there's some communications, uh, the communications go straight to like uh, Daphne and me and they will get referred to the group and everybody gets copied. So there's no, uh, there's no like, uh, there's no, because um, they also look with, look with sunshine, it's also a lot about the appearance of conflict. Mm -hmm. Like uh, Bob and I, we're members of APA uh, Florida. So we talk about a bunch of other things. So I can see that some people may be thinking that that could be an issue. Uh, to make sure, I'll, I'll talk to our, uh, our lawyer and uh, we'll get your communication on that. But like I said, you know, for an advisory group, it's they all, especially if you're within the same cities, it's definitely, I do think that there's an advantage of that. Just like keep keeping the lines of communication open. But I don't want to affect anyone of you, definitely. Okay, I appreciate a couple other questions if I might, um, unless yes. we want to take turns. Um, we. Uh, Okay, so your definition of corridor, for example, we have areas uh, just outside the city limits of Kissimmee that are that are that are very close to 441, but are part of the county. Um, so, uh, is is that part of the pur your purview uh, areas that would be Osceola County, yeah. but not technically in the city? Osceola County is a member of government of the Center for Real Planning Council. Uh, when we are approached about, unless we get approached by the property owner, which is different. Uh, if we get approached with, by the county that they have a couple of properties that they want to, um, they want to assess, uh, definitely that will, be, that will be definitely included. And we're going a little, the definition we use, I think we use like about, did we say Charles it was going to be half a mile from the corridor? It was the target area? Uh, that fact. was, yeah, that was the, the general as the primary. Um, the because, primary. Yeah, as the OBT was um, yeah. showing the, the greatest need as far well as from redevelopment and, and sites that yeah. uh, had been surveyed. Yeah, it doesn't mean we already had conversations with Belinda, the city of, there's a site at the airport. 
at the Kissimmee Airport that we might be looking at uh, to try to do an assessment. So we definitely, for our definition right now, our primary target is the core, that area on the corridor and the coalition cities. If it's something in the county, we probably will, depending on how much we have, we, we can definitely probably do a phase one, but we will have to look for additional funding for a phase two through the okay. state or the federal government. And and you mentioned the the airport. That's that's of interest to me because two schools that I'm very involved with are adjacent to their Osceola High School and Thacker Avenue Elementary School, right adjacent to the airport there. Um, as well as I'm on the board of a nonprofit that is uh, right near downtown Kissimmee, and we may we hopefully will be doing some uh, some construction on that that property uh, eventually. So that may be tied in. But okay. thank you. That's all I had for now. Oh, okay. Thank you, Robert. I think um, we'll get to Serge. I see your hand up so we can answer your question and then we can go ahead and move on. Yeah, I got a, a couple. Um, Luis, thank you for your breakdown there. Um, just to help me better understand the short term goals of the committee, is it to identify more sites that's not currently listed as brownfields? Is that the reason why we're engaging with the community? Or is it to, or is the primary focus to uh, ID specific sites that we want to actually incorporate these dollars into for uh, redevelopment, remediation, redevelopment? Um, yeah, the, they sounded pretty similar, both of the things you were saying. So let me see. I, I, hopefully, I'll provide you the, the right answer that, that you need. Uh, what we want from you, and again, it's mainly. You know your city as well, much better than we do. And uh, you're in contact with the community. So if you have a site that uh, will that you think could be targeted to this program, I will definitely have you do that. I see your main role though as being kind of more like a community ambassador. And if somebody in the city of Longwood has some questions about Brownfield's program, where CERC is similar to uh, Brownfield Advisory Committee and can hopefully answer some questions or refer uh, the person to Daphne or me to have that conversation. So I'm not gonna put the pressure on anyone, especially if this is a group, this is a volunteer group, and I'm very careful when I talk with vol uh, volunteers, is that, again, you're giving us your time, so I don't want to put the onus on any of you to actually uh, found any sites for us. But you are kind of like the one of the first uh, faces that we're gonna see in the community. So that's, I think that's your main role, being our ambassador. Well, that's Bro Luis, I can add something to that, and yes. I know Brian can as well. Um, as part of the grant application, EPA um, wished to know that the, community is being um, informed as to what the Brownfields program uh, is uh, all about and that they have an opportunity to provide input into what's going on, not a voting, but input as to uh, what's happening in their communities where the Brownfields program can be beneficial uh, because the understanding this is not a one-time thing, but a program that has will have a long existence as long as the federal government and the state government um, have it as uh, um, viable programs. And I don't see anything going away because of um, the broad implications it has both to all aspects of, of the community, whether it's commercial, industrial, residential, um, it, it has a major impact, or can have a major impact, and also uh, to community education. And when we look at the environmental justice aspect, it digs deeper into the aspect of wanting communities to be aware of the, uh, the federal governments, and specifically EPA, and 
the concerns of making sure that we have a healthy environment and that environment mean economic and, and social. But Brian can probably add it from a, the EPA perspective. Yeah, um, yeah, I'll, I'll say that I've, in my experience, these projects work the best when there's some flexibility uh, built in. So as, uh, as Luis already mentioned, uh, you know, a few sites have already had phase ones initiated on them. And, uh, you know, those, those were probably what we call the highest priority sites. But uh, I think Luis showed the slide that showed this was a $600,000 grant. So in general, the idea is that we want, uh, you know, a few sites to hit the ground running, but that's not going to be the only work that's accomplished with the grant. And that's where uh, you guys as the, as the formal coalition partners in your communities come in uh, to, bring, to bring those sites to, um, to the attention of Luis and his team and, you know, work on addressing sites that you and your community have the most concerns about. So, um, the, the word brownfield means different things depending on uh, where you are and what the, what the context is. But really, it's any, any site that needs a little bit of environmental work to, you know, get it, in, get it working towards a, re, towards a reuse. So I, I, that's really what we um, want to listen to you and your stakeholders and your communities. Uh, because you guys, like, like we were saying, you guys know your communities and know, know the sites that um, kind of fit kind of fit that mold. And if I can add one thing that I, I think one aspect we haven't really talked much is that the opportunity to use this grant, uh, additional funding to leverage uh, this grant opportunity. Right now, what we only think we can do with the, with, with the ground fields, we have some planning money. It's a very small amount of the pot, but there's definitely, most of it is gonna go to clean up but there might be opportunities, like if we got like a really good redevelopment site and we're able to bring another grant from the state, for example, uh, for one of the technical assistance grants and do like kind of like a placemaking project uh, within one of the cities, it will assist with the redevelopment of, and I think because all of you are very connected with your communities, you sort of know the areas better than we do in the neighborhoods and what type of projects might be needed uh, in the near future that, hey, maybe we cannot cover it with this grant, but there may be other grant opportunities that because they see that we already started this work, might, uh, might benefit when we're applying for additional funding, whether it's us or the cities. Uh, and Lewis, I'd like to add something to that just for the sake of making sure um, that the membership knows that there are really four components to the EPA's program, and, and it is initiated by the assessment uh, grant. But you got the assessment grant, you got the cleanup grant, you got the planning grant, and you got the revolving loan fund. So it starts off with identifying properties that unless there is some assistance, they would never be a performing asset or contribute positively to the local government's tax base unless there is some initiative to help it be market driven. So that's where the assessment comes into play when uh, a grantee can provide that assistance by uh, having an assessment performed on a property where maybe the owner just doesn't have the money to do it. And the buyer says, I'm not gonna buy this property unless it's success. And I know that it's void of any environmental impact or the impacts are such that I can put it into my formula for the redevelopment and I can work with that. And, and neither are party to whatever contamination that may exist after uh, an assessment has been performed. If assessment has been performed and there is an environmental impact, 
then that's where the cleanup grant can come into play and, and look at what are the natures of the contamination and the cause of the contamination. If all those things pan out well, uh, 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 the private sector can apply for uh, a cleanup grant through a revolving loan fund that uh, say the planning council will uh, receive in order to provide funding as a source for uh, doing cleanup. Then there's the planning grant where um, the not-for-profits in the organization uh, within the area can also apply for uh, understanding how to better serve their communities uh, from an environmental standpoint and, and then also spill over to the economics. Uh, the revolving loan fund can be um, acquired through EPA and that could be from the planning council or a not-for-profit organization to help um, de deal with the cleanup of properties that have been determined to be contaminated. So the, the four elements of the program come into play as a sequence of activities take place starting with the assessment. And again, uh, let me use the piece of example. I'm gonna have to talk about Kissimmee again because it's the one that I'm more- uh, Please, we're a little short on time. So I okay, let's go to the next one then, yes, keep going. I think, um, Serge, you may have had a question, but could we, we could save it for the Q&A that's gonna be at the end of the PowerPoint. I think we can get back on our, our timetable. So um, thank you for, for the, your questions. Thank you for answering Louise and Charles, of course, your expertise is always appreciated. So I'm gonna go ahead and jump ahead to our next section and talk about the back overview that I'll be discussing and start by talking about the purpose of you know, why we're assembling a bag and um, the benefits of it. So, you know, long story short, um, the purpose of, of having this bag is to satisfy requirements that EPA has laid out for all of their brownfield grants. Essentially, they want to see all of the brownfield grant recipients doing some form of community involvement, some form of public outreach and engagement. So, in order to satisfy those requirements, we are putting together our brownfield advisory committee we are making sure that we are looking at the types of people that they want on the committee. And I think we've done a great job of doing so. Um, they want us to include persons who are involved in the development world, the banking world, um, nonprofit work, um, general just community stakeholders who are partners with other community leaders and can be a funnel um, for providing their feedback into this process. EPA, um, also the state's program, the DEP, Department of Environmental Protection, they have their brownfield program. They also, in their Florida statutes, outline the, that whenever they're designating brownfields or there's brownfield programming work, um, a bag is developed and used for community outreach reasons. So they are eager to ensure that this is done because they understand that brownfield redevelopment is closely tied with community revitalization. And they wanna make sure that the residents who are most impacted by those community changes and uh, revitalizations have an opportunity to be, in, be a part of the process and to voice you know, their main concerns. You know, Like we've said before, you, these community members, they know better what's going on in the communities. They know better what kind of redevelopment should be taking place. So. Both programs understand this and as such have made sure that it's a requirement for most brownfield um, initiatives. And as mentioned before, our awesome leads and our coalition cities have been helpful in identifying our BAC members. So last year we started with our outreach and I'm sure you all remember receiving your official letter um, in the mail or your email inviting you to be on board. So they've been very helpful throughout that whole process. And again, um, if you're wondering who your, your person is for your city, um, because we're hoping that you will be a representative of these cities, you'll know that for Apopka, we have Shakinya Harris Jackson. The city of Eustis, we have Mr. Tom Carino. For Kissimmee, we have Samaya Singleton. And for Longwood, we have Mr. Tom Kruger. We also have um, Craig Cambrick, who is currently you know, representing the RPC. And like Louise mentioned, 
right now at this time stage, we're wanting to more so focus on back members who can represent our coalition cities. So, you know, this year we're, we're mostly focusing on making sure we have representation from them and uh, we're doing pretty good. We're wanting to strengthen it a little bit in the city of Houston and also for the RPC in the next few years. Um, and we think that with the amount of brownfield projects that we have coming in from the coalition cities and also from um, just the region itself, the East Central Florida region, that we'll be able to um, grow the back because like the um, community involvement plan that we've developed for this, pro this project, um, the back is a, is a growing and, and changing kind of tool that we're using. So we're hoping that we can, it can grow, it can change and we can expand it and um, have more, more members added in the next few years. So, Another important purpose of having the bag is EPA has through a large body of research, programming, collaboration and so forth, they've underlined the intricate impact that brownfields have, not just on health equity, but also on environmental justice. But we're gonna start and talk about the impacts that it has on health equity. So in my last position, I mentioned I did a health impact assessment on brownfield programming and learned a lot about the impacts that Brownfield can have on the social determinants of health. And so if you haven't heard of social determinants of health um, through COVID-19, I think that definition was just floating around a lot. But if you haven't heard it, you know, these are those quality of life factors that inform your day-to-day -day living and your health and well-being at a greater impact than, you know, diet or exercise can, because this impacts your education. Um, so determinants of health impacts your access to parks, your quality housing, um, the type of job opportunities that are available to you. You know, the social determinants of health, you know, these are these factors that just more so, you know, in, inform your, your way that you live, work, play. Um, so brownfields in themselves impact social, like a, a number of social determinants of health. Um, I was able to study this during the HIA and I'll tell you, you know, them just the way that they are. They are these, you know, potentially polluting land uses that are in different communities. And if they're, you know, not polluted, it's likely that they are like they're vacant or derelict properties. They may be um, blighted and causing other blighting influences within a community. So just in the fact that they may be polluted, they are immediate, you know, risk to our natural environment. You know, there are immediate risks to our water resources and other natural resources that our communities rely on for health, for tourism, for a number of reasons. Um, and then it also impacts health outcomes because the more prevalence that there are of brownfields in a community, the more likely that uh, type of individual is exposed to them, usually low income, minority groups, disabled groups, um, a number of, you know, vulnerable populations are more likely to be exposed to these pollutions. And there is a link between this exposure and health outcomes. So we know that um, it's important to think about your communities and how close that they are to these potential brownfields. And um, also it can have an impact on climate change due to the impacts that it has on the environment um, and also land use because here are these properties in your community that are taking up purposeful space that can be used for shelters, temporary housing in the event of an emergency storm, or it can be used as open green space that can facilitate improved stormwater management after a extreme weather event, but instead it's a brownfield. So, you know, it can have very real Im implications for, for climate change and resilience in that way as well. And of course, economic stability. We know that, you know, these properties usually deter investment into communities. It deters um, there being a mix of socioeconomic groups that can help stabilize the tax base. So this leads to a, uh, a decrease in neighborhood quality. It can lead to a decrease in home ownership rates. It can lead to a number of things which can impact the community's ability to socially connect and thrive. So it's, under, it's important as a, a back and just in general to understand how brownfields impact the social determinants of health because this has a serious implication on health equity and people's quality of life. So another purpose of having a back is to work to kind of correct in instances of environmental injustice from the past. And environmental injustice is kind of defined as a disproportionate 
exposure of different groups to this kind of pollution to brownfields. And those, those vulnerable groups are usually low income groups or minority groups. And, um, you know, in some instances, you know, brownfields are perfect examples of what environmental injustice is because in some way, maybe knowing or unknowingly a group of decision makers at some point had a, had a um, hand in the creation of these properties, these land uses that had a negative impact on surrounding communities. Um, the placement of landfills or um, manufacturing plants or um, number of auto shops and zones, those kind of properties in close proximity to these communities that oftentimes don't have the political the social capital that they need to speak for their own interests um, and prevent these land uses from being around them. Uh, these, situ these situations happen. And you know now we have the number of brownfields that we have. I think Serge mentioned the number before. And every time I hear that number, I'm like, okay, sure. Um, that's how many brownfields we have. I, I always feel like there are probably more in our country alone, but um, you know, in working to engage communities and incorporate their, their input, their feedback and ideas, their interests into these brownfield redevelopment processes that we're trying to lead, we're able to better correct issues of environmental injustice in the past and better facilitate environmental justice, which is defined here. And I would go through it, but I think, um, I, think I did a good job explaining that. So we're gonna go ahead and move forward and give you an illustration this is a infographic that our intern Edwin developed for our program. And it kind of gives a good visualization of how we can you know, find this pathway of correcting environmental injustices that have created these vacant, blighted, you know, possibly polluted land uses in communities and create them into more purposeful spaces. Um, a term I like to use is health fields um, that EPA kind of uses these health fields that um, provide health services, parks, food services, uh, whatever kind of services the community knows that they need, um, needs to be redeveloped into, into their communities. These are the types of properties that we want to move towards. And this is essentially kind of an illustration of what we're wanting to do with our program. And at the bottom, it shows like the steps taken to uh, facilitate the assessment process. So we love this illustration. We think it's a good picture of the goal that we're trying to achieve and also an outline of the steps that are gonna be taken to achieve it. So I love to talk about health equity. Um, of course, equitable development is something that we're trying to strive to um, attain. And so with any type of kind of health equity related work, I always wanna make sure the group I'm working with is up on these types of definitions on health disparities and health inequities, because they are two different things. Um, so I'll just, you know, let you all know, health disparity is kind of like the circumstance that you find yourself in. It's the situation um, where there's the differences Oh, I'm sorry, that's health inequity. Let me just start with health inequities then because I've already started. So the health inequity is the situation that you're in. And it's a systematic and kind of unfair and avoidable, absolutely avoidable situations you're finding yourself in um, where you know your health determinants, these health factors in your life are kind of just different from another group. And so they're probably less than, and so this creates a health disparity for you. And so the health disparity is kind of the differences and statistics that show um, that there are differences in health outcomes that are based on the differences in those quality of life factors um, and those health factors. So when you think about it, the health inequity is um, being overly exposed to traffic and different um, interstate corridors, so to say, different high highways. And then the health disparity is the difference in um, respiratory diseases differences and kind of cancer incidences for different groups. Um, so I hope that that does make sense. And I hope that we can uh, continue to understand these terms and use them um, in our work. Next slide goes over health equity. And I love to look at this visualization. It kind of just sums up equality, equity, and justice. Um, in my work, I like to strive for justice because you know this helps to e remove all the different inequities and systematic barriers that are blocking 
every kind of resident, regardless of their age, race, sex, from um, being able to achieve uh, the highest possible standard of health that they can achieve. So um, yes, that's essentially our definition for health equity and a great visualization on what it means. So back to our back, we are going to talk about the goal and it's essentially to enhance the connection between the Brownfield program activities and community stakeholders who we want to be involved um, in the process, who we want to have their feedback incorporated. And this is in order to better align what we're doing with the needs of the community. And so when we do this, there are a number of benefits. We know that this work will lead to a more engaged and empowered um, resident base and community stakeholders who are better able to understand the process, trust the people that they're working with, and know that you know in the end, there will be a service of environmental justice and improved quality of life, um, a lead to a, a more healthy community for them and for their, their children. And also in doing this, we know that our Brownfield Redevelopment initi Initiatives are more successful because not only did we you know reach our goal of mitigating and erasing brownfields in our communities, but we're also having two-pronged success in that the community wins and is able to get a benefit from the work that we've done. So back duties, this question kind of came up earlier. So this is a better outline of, you know, the, the essential ask that we have of our back members mm -hmm. as they sit on our uh, sit on the back and facilitate the brownfield work we're doing. So first, we're wanting to, you all to essentially be our, our funnel and receiving public comment um, and feedback from the different residents or community leaders and stakeholders that you work with and getting their comment on proposed and ongoing brownfield rehabil rehabilitation activities that we're taking on and have their feedback be touching on any different matter that they see as critical such as community safety, economic growth, um, local employment opportunities, all of these different matters. We're hoping that you all can kind of help them in facilitating um, that feedback to us. And we're gonna make sure we go over the tools that we're gonna be able to use to um, ensure that you all are able to easily do that. We don't, like Louise says, we're not trying to add on any hard tasks or, or anything like that to your, to your, your plate. So that's uh, duty number one. For number two, it's essentially reviewing and recommending to the Brownfield Coalition different ways that we can encourage public interest and make sure that we're consistently being able to um, reach out to our residents and that their participation in our Brownfield initiatives um, is, is steady and increasing. So there's that. There's also reviewing and recommending potential Brownfield project sites to the Brownfield Coalition. Um, again, like Louise said, there's you know not too much pressure there, but if the conversation does come up, if you are aware of different persons or properties that um, may lead to, you know, the successful completion of, of task number three, then we welcome that conversation. Then there is reviewing and providing feedback on public engagement um, and education materials as is needed. Um, one kind of tool I hope to push out soon is quarterly updates. So we're, you know, doing these assessments and so forth, but, you know, having your feedback on it won't be as easy unless you're regularly updated on what we're doing. So I will probably be pushing that out um, in the next few months. So if you all would, I'll probably email it to you to get your feedback on it. And that will be kind of just the way that we will go about that. And then also reviewing and commenting on technical doc documents, such as site assessment report findings as needed. So this is probably the least likely duty that you'll probably have to take on, but um, if it does come up, just know that, you know, that's something that we, we may need. Oh, I'm jumping around. Sorry about that. So again, we're hoping that you all can kind of understand the Brownfield redevelopment pro process and be able to come forward to us on ideas that you have for different projects that you see us working on or pro projects that are going on in the region. And this is a great graphic from EPA's uh, reuse possibilities for brownfield sites fact sheets. So I did early, I think last week, send out a number of documents that um, you all could review in, pre in preparation for this meeting. 
And so this one just kind of overviews the different types of redevelopment that can come out of brownfield projects to improve communities. So um, I want you to just kind of take this in the back of your head going forward and think about how we can use these redevelopment types to um, better enhance the communities we're working in. Oops, jumping around. So now we're gonna shift and talk a little bit more about the different tools we're using to facilitate public outreach for the Brownfield program. So there's the community involvement plan. I mentioned that our grant did require the submission of one. So this is something that um, we are developing. The latest draft was completed in January. And um, the, main, the main purpose of the plan is to um, be a guide for facilitating public engagement for our project and outline the different strategies we're going to take, um, have a schedule in on when we're planning to have these public engagements. That's something that's still in the process, but you know, it's essentially just kind of um, an outline on how we're going to be doing our outreach and the methods that we're gonna be used, the coalition members who are involved and the partners and key community-based organizations that um, will be helping will be helping us. So the outline for the CIP goes as listed. We have a general overview for what the CIP is, the goals of the CIP, of course, the contact information that will be needed for not just the RPC, but for all of our coalition cities, for EPA and um, our contact at the state. And then an overview of the Brownfield Advisory Committee as well. And then the different community involvement strategies that we're going to be using. Um, and that does include a media kit and our website that Ken's story is going to be um, presenting on in just a moment. And for our CIP, we are working on developing a more concrete public engagement activity schedule that will go in and also outline the different outreach that we've done with different NGOs in the area. So we've been able to reach out and kind of pique the interest of different NGOs in the area just to see how they can also support the work that we're trying to do. So far, we've been able to kind of pique interest from the APOPCA Chamber of Commerce, from the Central Florida Foundation, and also from the Orlando Regional Realtor Association and their foundation. So that success is, you know, that process is going very successfully and we hope to have those amendments in the CIP soon for you all to, to see, especially the public engagement schedule, because we want you to be able to have information on when we're going to be reaching out to the community um, so you can forward that to your constituents so they can be aware and even participate. So I think that is my bit. I'm gonna pass it along to Ken Storr to overview the media kit and website. Thank you, Daphne. Um, the media kit, I know that we have had a lot we've covered today. And so the media kit is here to help um, be the one source you need to go to for all the information. If we can go to the next slide. Um, within the media kit itself, we have the history of the various communities um, involved in the Brownfields Coalition. Uh, we also have the details of the Brownfields Advisory Committee, um, different definitions and acronyms that are used in applications and, and paperwork, um, some best practices uh, from sites across the state, and then uh, contact information. Now, this is a living document. It will evolve over the course of the three-year program. And we're building this as a awareness um, campaign. So for those who want to seek more information, um, you can provide this media kit to them or you yourself can use it to better understand the program. Okay. Um, you can find this on our website, um, ecfrpc.org slash brownfields. Uh, there we have um, the media kit, we have the Brownfields um, Committee uh, information. Uh, we also have other documents as well. And on the bottom of the website, we have a form um, that you can use to request more information or um, send to those who want more information.
And here's some more info from the website. Um, as you can tell, um, there's uh, quite a bit there, um, but the place to go for uh, your one-stop shop would be the media kit. And that you can find that at the top of the website. Oh, okay, that was your last slide. Well, one thing I do wanna add really quickly, Ken, and thank you for, for that overview, is the, on the um, right, you're seeing what are brown fields. Underneath that is a different, um, it was a series of different resources that you can use to kind of find out more information about, you know, brown fields and links to environmental health, public health and so forth. And um, the form that Ken mentioned earlier can also be used, it can be used to request information, but it can also be used to submit information. So if you're um, aware of any information that you want to, you know, stream along to us, you know, you can use that, you can use that information box to do so. And you can also forward our website link to um, potential community stakeholders or leaders who you know may have input on what we're doing. You can forward that link to them and they can use that as a way to kind of say, hey, you know, I've heard about what you're doing. So-and-so, let me have feedback. Um, so that's also a, a way to use that, that tool. Oh, I'm going up, sorry. I'm having PowerPoint troubles today. So thank you, Ken, that kind of wraps that portion up. So other tools that we have are just kind of resources that can be used for educational learning that I want to touch base on very quickly because we want to move into our group discussion portion. But you know, EPA has a number of different educational fact sheets about brown for redevelopment. Um, I forward those to you in an email. Always feel free to utilize those for, for learning purposes if you need them. There's also on the EPA's website a site for grant recipient success stories. So if you're kind of wrapping your mind around how this process works, how can it really be successful? How can it lead to you know, these redevelopments for affordable housing or parks, new businesses and so forth? There are plenty of examples on there for you to read up on. They also have a land re revitalization toolkit that kind of walks through the process for EPA Revital, uh, sorry, for brownfield revitalization. And also uh, more information about the new infrastructural law that's been passed and has opened the gates for a good deal of funding for brownfield programming and redevelopment for fiscal year 2022 and 23. So if you're curious to learn more about brownfields and the type of funding that's available, um, there's that and a number of other resources and fact sheets on that out. And there's also the environmental justice screening tool that EPA has. So I did talk a lot about environmental justice earlier. They do have a tool that they use. And what it is is, a, is essentially a mapping tool that um, uses, oh gosh, I hope you guys can't hear it, the emergency vehicles going past on I-4 in front of my, my office window. Okay, it's gone. Sorry about that. But what the EJ screen does, it utilizes a data set that allows it to map and overlay different in, um, indicators, um, usually environmental data with demographic data. And it uses this overlay to give a visualization of the extent of environmental injustice that might be going on in a community. So this is a great tool right now. In this image, I have it zoomed into my hometown in Pensacola, Florida. Um, for zip code 32505, where my father is still a resident. So it's able to kind of show you these different um, indicators and you can learn a lot about the area as far as, you know, it's proximity to uh, traffic and um, interstates and proximity to super funds or, you know, the amount of lead paint that's going on in housing or wastewater discharge. So it's a great tool to kind of just learn more about those kind of environmental uh, metrics and how they may be playing out in your community. So I did talk a lot about EPA stuff. I didn't know if Brian had anything to add or Charles, if you had anything to add to that, or if not, we can move into our group discussion. Nothing to add, Daphne. All right. So then what we're going to do for our group discussion portion 
is we're going to do a poll and we're going to just ask you to answer a few questions. Um, and so we're hoping that this can get a good conversation going. And if any questions that come up, we can you know talk through it. But we're gonna go ahead and start the polling. So we can get started. Um, it's interesting for some reason. A poll is saying it's inactive. Sorry, everyone, give me one second to see if I can get this back online and we can start polling. I think you may need to stop sharing your screen. Um, let me, I can launch it. Let me. Do you see it now? Yes. I just launch it. So. Uh, we have one answer. So, okay. That's interesting. I'm not able to see it. I'm not sure why. I guess I'll have to leave you with this part and let you know the results. Sorry oh my about goodness. that. It's work co host. So I don't know why you're giving me some rights that uh, they didn't give them to Daphne. So, okay. I so think it may be because I joined from the website. I went to yeah. zoom.com to join. Oh, cool but, is that, Daphne? So right now we have. 11 answers out of 16 uh, people that have been polled. So I think that gives a good idea. Uh, the overwhelming majority of, of our members have been here for over 10 years, followed by five to 10 years. Like uh, there's only been one person here less than a year. I wonder who that is. Has somebody, that the person wants to out themselves or? That was me, I'm actually in Georgia. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's good then. Okay. So that's good. Um, let's see if we can. So you asked me to lend and pull. Can so you results. share the results? Yes. yes. Now you see it here. Okay. So I'm going to stop sharing is everyone, that. Um, is everyone able to view the results? Because, okay. Um, Luis, can you go ahead and do poll number two? And I'm going to jump off and see if I can jump back on and if that'll work. Yeah, let me go and see if I can do, I guess I have to close this one and do poll. Ah, okay, I know what I need to do now. Sorry about that. So question number two, which county do you currently reside in? And I need to launch it because if I don't launch it, it's not gonna work. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so we have 11 of 16 right now. So there's definitely, oh, there's probably Brian. We all know that. <laughs> but we have three people from Osceola four people from Orange, uh, two from Seminole, and two from Lake County. So I'm gonna end the poll and show. Oh, now I see it put my polling session as inactive. Oh, yeah, yeah. I guess, did you, use, did you use my account, Daphne? I did. Yeah, I, th I think that's an issue. Can you uh, poll it now? Just go to polls Let's, and see if you can do it. I can hit end poll, but let me see. Share results. Yes, yeah, so just share the results. <sighs> Let's see. 
All right, so it looks like majority of us are in Orange County. So there should be a way for me to, that was what I anticipated. Let's see. So now let me, let's say call host. You know, I think to smooth out these technical difficulties, really for every meeting, you ought to have a 14 year old kid in here working it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that we're, we're working on that definitely um so i'm going to to prevent confusion go ahead and share my camera and i think you should be able to launch the poll now yes just change my name so people don't think i'm louise and then let's start poll. Did we already do, this is question number two. And no, I've we're gonna be three. Okay, so let's do number three. So I want to know after reviewing the different types of brownfield sites that can be found in most communities, um, can you just let us know which type of brownfield do you think is most prevalent in our region in East Central Florida? So we have a list, um, of course, gas stations, fuel storage facilities is an option, car lots, auto repair shops, or metal recycling yards, like metal shops, um, railroad facilities, dry cleaners and industrial laundry facilities, golf courses, and then old manufacturing facilities, factories, or landfills. So did you launch the question? I did, and people are answering. Okay, that's good then. Hey, Daphne, Are you able I to see it, Louise? No, I don't see it. Oh. I'm sorry, Serge. I said, can I add the eyesore and I4 building as I'm staring at it outside my window? <laughs> <laughs> Enough color if a committee member adds that in. That's a... oh, I'm going to make a note that. right now. <laughs> Just Daphne you. is an innocent bystander from coming from Pensacola and <laughs> Tallahassee. So she doesn't know the long history of the I4 eyesore. But definitely, uh, well, for us who have been here for a while, we have, I remember seeing it all the time in, uh, coming from Pringles. Yeah, I think the Old Testament had it too. <laughs> I think it's it's pre-Cambrian. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. So I think we've gotten most of our votes in. Can I share the results? So our winner was the car lots, auto repair shops, and metal recycling yards. So I'm kind of curious, you know, people who voted in this way, you know, can you kind of let me know your experience? You know, why did you vote this way? What are your, your thoughts on these kind of properties and their impact on the community? So for, for me, Daphne, I agree with gas stations and I voted for dry cleaners because if when you look at, um, SDG, Sustainability Development Goals. These two particularly tie in with water and health of the, uh, health of the community. So these sites also, because the groundwater table here in Central Florida is pretty precious to us, this, this is a generational impact when it comes down to drinking water impact. So that's part of the reason why I selected it. And, um, uh, they're, they're a lot more addressable also because you can do ex situ or in situ type treatments and not have to haul stuff, media all the way up to like Alabama, which costs a lot of money. Interesting, especially on the water, water factor. Thank you, Serge. Yes, Robert. Um, reading this as what I think my perception of the most prevalent rather than you know priority is just kind of what I see on that uh, OBT 441 corridor and, and of what I know of it and what may be out there. So this is just anecdotal on my part. It just seems like that is something that is, uh, could be prevalent. Gas stations as well. Absolutely. When we, um, when I first came on and was just learning more about the history of OBT, I learned, you know, it was, in its heyday, one of those tourism heavy corridors and people would drive up and down. It was a scenic route. 
know, orange blossom groves all in through it. So, you know, people would feel so comfortable and want to drive up and down it. And it was like a main corridor. So the need for shops and gas stations and so forth along it, along it um, were important. But now that it's less so for that need, uh, we're still seeing those, those land uses and needing them to kind of catch up with the times as well. All right, any other kind of comments on how you all voted or any kind of lingering thoughts? Well, I chose um, the gas stations just due to the, you know, that's what I see majority of the time here in Apopka. Um, and I know from working in the city of Apopka, we've had uh, gas stations that had to go through the EPA cleanup and all those particulars. Um, so that's kind of, and it's, we have more, I would say more gas station than we do car locks um, and probably auto repair. So I just think it just, you know, as far as our community, that's what's more impactful. And the second would probably would have been the dry cleaners. Cause I think we have a, a dry cleaners that may be on a list of that 12 that you guys may have mentioned previously. Um, mm -hmm. So that's kind of the things that came to mind when I, I saw this question. I first lived here in 1986, and I remember going uh, to the Florida Mall when it was still like, I don't know, a year old or whatever, and most of OBT being, uh, you know, orange groves and that sort of thing. Is there is there any uh, thought or uh, pesticides, things like that, that were used previously in some of those orange grove areas? Is that anything that is, uh, is a thought or has been addressed or looked at or concerned? I think that may be a, a bit of a Charles question and also a Louise question. You know, just to speak to uh, back to orange groves, arsenic uh, was used pretty prevalently um, to address issues uh, for pesticiding. And <clears throat> when the amount of development that has taken place um, with the orange groves meant that whatever was there kind of got washed uh, to some extent into uh, catch basins, but that's been the situation with um, orange rolls and uh, the, the arsenic. And the same, you know, along the rail lines because they use uh, the arsenic for uh, purposes of maintaining the, the rail uh, line and the uh, the vegetation that was along the way. But Brian probably got a deeper uh, perspective of that and overall. All righty. I think that unless anyone has any lingering comments, we can go ahead and move to poll number four. I'm going to launch this. So what we wanna know with this one is of the groups listed below, which ones do you probably think are more negatively impacted? Someone already answered, okay, <laughs> very quick. Are most negatively impacted by you know brownfields, by community blight brought on by brownfields, community vacancy and the disinvestment um, that brownfields usually um, incur in their communities. Um, which groups are, are probably most impacted in the East Central Florida region? Give it 10 more seconds for any lingering was answers to come in. All right, so we're gonna end the poll. I'm gonna share this. So as you can see, the minority groups and other persons of color um, took this win by about 20, uh, I think, yeah, about almost 30%. And then housing insecure or homeless groups is the second second group. And uh, you all are aligned with my, my way of thinking as well. When I think of 
you know, this brownfield redevelopment, my passion is for housing. I see, I would have voted B because I, you know, I work downtown. I kind of cross I4 all the time and I see the need um, for new housing um, and through whatever means we can, you know, find it in brownfield infill. Brownfield creates that type of infill development that can lead to more housing and can kind of stabilize our, our housing situation right now. So that would have been the way I voted, but, you know, absolutely minority groups and other persons of color um, are usually, are usually likely to live in these communities that are, you know, low resource communities. Um, so they are usually impacted. So did anyone have any kind of comments or feedback on this? Did I leave anyone out? Yes, Serge. Yeah, this is actually very consistent with what we see around the, around the country. Uh, we're actually doing a project right now with Exelon Corporation uh, in one of their brownfield sites in Washington, D.C. Uh, they're one of our investors in, in their climate change impact fund. And we are basically addressing a catch basin uh, with PCBs and we're now starting to do a second project of stormwater uh, remediation. But it, it is what it is, right? Like when, when there's gentrification happening, uh, more minorities and lower income families are moving to the outskirts of the cities. Mm -hmm. And that's where landfills and all these types of industrial sites typically are at. And that's what we're basically starting to see. And, and th th those groups are not the most, they don't have any advocacy really until, um, you know, the private partner partners, uh, the private, the, the, the triple P partners up and actually addresses these types of sites. Um, to to help with the, the future, right? So very consistent. Awesome. And I appreciate, you know, your thoughtfulness on, you know, the situation with um, gentrification and what it can do. It really helps to decentralize a group of people. Um, and, you know, one pattern I, as a planner have noticed how, you know, in the city, people are wanting to move more towards downtown into these urbanized places where black or brown populations from the past years had no other choice but to live in because that's where the majority of the affordable housing was. So now people are saying, oh, we wanna live downtown. It's exciting, it's great to be close to all these different amenities that are po popping up in downtown. And now they're bringing their, their families into the downtown area and that's creating an increase in housing properties increase in housing costs, I'm sorry, in the downtown area, the central urban area, and they're needing to move out into the suburbs. And, you know, they were once, you know, segregated in one area, now they're having to move out into a new area. And um, that does create a change in how they're exposed to these different types of brownfields. Maybe they were exposed to different one type when they were downtown, but now they're kind of closer to a, a different type now that they've been moved out. Um, I see hands raised for Ms. Erica Simmons. I think this goes along with what you were just saying, because if it if I'm living here and these these issues lower the value of my property right now where I'm living and it makes it less attractive until you move. Right. And then all of a sudden it's revitalized, you know, so it's actually lowering the value of my property as I live here. And, you know, making it less safe and more, you know, less desirable. Mm -hmm. so you mean the parking lots, the brownfields do that? Well, the yeah, the parking lots, the brownfields. I mean, it becomes mm -hmm. a place where homeless people live and it becomes, you know, more of the hangout for homeless people because it's unattractive to other people. And it does create even more empty houses and empty lots because other people want to move away from this area because of it. Exactly. Excellent. You're spot on. I think I see Edith's hand up as well. No, I, I agree with her too, but uh, I didn't raise my hand. It was right. Uh, I wrote it at, in the beginning, but I, okay. I don't know. If I think, uh, I'm sorry. No, no, but it's, that, that's my saying. Uh, the way she answered it, it's, it's correct. Uh, that's what I, 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 well, I live in the south of Popgut, so, it, you know, it, it can create a problem, but then again, it may not. I have no idea. Okay. I know you're, you're being in South Apopka, you'll have a lot of good information for us um, and feedback from people who, who may be engaged, especially we're, we're wanting to do more outreach in Apopka soon. 
So uh, we'll make sure we'll, we'll be in touch on that. Were there any other um, questions or comments for this question? Yes, Robert. Um, just that I saw housing insecure homeless groups as being kind of a larger umbrella that certainly does include minority groups and other persons of color, but knowing our population here and our families in transition as they're uh, thought of um, in our motels and some of our trailer park areas and that sort of thing, that's a pretty broad group and, um, and that's why I went with the housing and insecure. I see that as an umbrella that covers mm -hmm. a lot of others. Absolutely. So I think we can stop sharing this one. Thank you all for your feedback. I think we can go ahead to our last poll, poll number five. So you should see it now. So this is asking, which of the following property reuse concepts do you think are most needed? in our region. And you can, you know, kind of think about your own city when you answer this question. Uh, think about your own constituents or, you know, friends or fellow property owners, what kind of redevelopment they would want to see um, have increased in the communities they live in. So there's affordable housing, parks, trails, and open space, grocery stores, farmers markets, and urban gardens, more local business that increases job creation, then there's green energy, EPA is saying, you know, with brownfield redevelopment, there's opportunity to develop more spaces for green energy. And then there's also historic preservation for those properties that are just known and uh, revered for their historical kind of role in a community. Um, that's also an option there. We can give it about 10 more minutes for you all to leave your question. I'm sorry, 10 more seconds for you all to leave your response. I know this one's a hard one. There's a lot of good options. Can we pick a couple of them? <laughs> um, we can discuss which ones you think are, are most, <laughs> most um, important. But I think for the poll, you can only select one. I know. I know. If only we could just do them all, you know, <laughs> that would be the dream. So I'm going to go ahead and end this poll. and share the results. So this one is a little bit more, you know, there's a bit of a mix here, but it looks like affordable housing did um, come out with the most, most wins, four out of 10. And so I think that goes back to the conversation we had from the previous question, you know, just knowing the need of, of affordable housing. I'm surprised to see no one said grocery stores um, or farmer's markets anything like that that's that's interesting to see did anyone have any kind of initial thoughts on how we voted or have an explanation on why they voted the way I, they did i got it well i know initially i started to go with the grocery stores but um i know particularly here in apopka um one of the biggest things has been is um job creation in our downtown area so that was ultimately why i decided to go that route um but you know, it was a pretty much a difficult choice out of all the things that I saw. But that's that's kind of what I saw as a need, need to, to hopefully help you know with, with the affordable housing because that's a that's a bigger animal as a whole. Um, so you know that one is going to be much more different <laughs> to deal, deal with. I second that. I second uh, Rogers. It just seems like the housing component is just kind of in our faces right now, right? And yeah. in need of recognition. Okay, Robert? Um, I do see Erica's hand has been up, so I don't want to cut in line there and eat us. So, but I do have oh. something to say, but I don't want to jump the queue such here. A such a gentleman. Uh, Erica, if you did have a comment, you can go ahead. I believe it might be by accident. I lowered my hand. Please go oh. ahead. Yeah, okay. Go ahead. I used to be manager at Disney, so I'm very uh, sensitive to queue jumping there. Um, Thank you. <laughs> sure. Um, so uh, I I chose affordable housing. Uh, one of the biases for me is that I'm on the affordable housing advisory committee, but but job creation was right up there because I see that you know, like Rogers is saying, if you have more jobs, 
then you create more uh, more income for people. People can better afford housing and that sort of thing. So you know, cart horse kind of thing. But I I see that. And, and, and I do want to see if someone uh, from uh, maybe Luis, maybe Daphne uh, could come talk to our AHAC uh, sometime uh, later this year. I think that would be terrific. We'll definitely put it in our calendar. Things to do. Definitely. We'll be very, very interested. I'll talk to Francis De Jesus with the city and, and, and get that on the agenda at some point. Definitely. Thank you. That'd be awesome. Thank you for the invitation. Um, so any other kind of comments? I'm kind of curious to know who voted um, Green Energy because you know we were a little skeptical to put that one on there, but yet we see a clear a vote for it. Also, we got one vote for historic preservation. So I'm interested to see, you know, who voted for, for that and you know, interested to know why. Uh -huh. Our people are being shy. That's all right. Um, Daphne, I, I didn't vote for the green energy, but I could see it as I drive through Maitland Avenue or Maitland uh, Exchange. There's uh, former landfills there that would be uh, great places for uh, solar farms and whatnot. So, you know, it's just another good way to kind of cover up the you know, long term uh, um, usage of a former landfill that's just, you know, creating, you know, or mitigating methane right now. So, but if you could couple that with um, go with green energy, I think kind of offsets the CO2 and, and uh, yeah, the CO2 uh, emissions and whatnot. Very cool. And you, you mentioned Maitland Avenue? Maitland Exchange. Oh, awesome, thank you. That's a good comment. Did anyone else have any comments? Did anyone think that I might have left out a redevelopment site? I'd just like to speak on the affordable housing and, and what that word really means today, affordable. Um, you know, depending upon the area you live, uh, that number has exponentially increased to the point where it has... Uh, included a, a, number, a higher level of income people into the affordable housing market. Um, I've seen rents and the adjustments by HUD to try to create um, rates and uh, increase uh, the base number for housing but the, the wages have not kept track with the market. And uh, for persons trying to finance a home is where the issue comes into play, that uh, things really are not affordable. Uh, and that term affordable housing has, um, I guess you could call it, a misleading statement in many cases. Mm. Wow. Thank you, Charles, for that, that thoughtful piece. It's important to kind of think about housing um, in that way. But did anyone else have any kind of comments on Charles's co uh, comment or any questions on the discussion? Questions? I definitely agree. This is Erica Simmons. That um, the cap on what affordable, what is considered affordable housing, um, is very low. It kind of squeezes people out. Because I had been in that situation in the past where you really aren't making that much, but you didn't really qualify for you know any programs, and were left out, squeezed out. It's an unfortunate, it's an unfortunate situation. Well, I didn't have any other kind of comments for, or any kind of questions for the discussion portion. 
um, we go ahead and move on to the, I know at the beginning, Serge, you might have, you might have had a question. So if there are any other kind of questions that we have, I'm happy to take them and kind of lead them to the group. Yeah, I actually just wanted to comment, Daphne. I was, I was encouraged to see the land redevelopment tool, toolkit as one of the toolkits that you had on the list. Um, Ecospheres was actually one of the seven pilot um, companies uh, or programs, that, uh, uh, companies or government entities that's within the program with ATSDR. So let us know how we could be of service or a helping hand with that. We we work closely with Laura Bergman, uh, and we 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 jump on a on a quarterly Browns meeting um, and and work with them and see how we could use that toolkit uh, throughout our communities. So pretty familiar with it. And then the other thing too is Seaclear, uh, uh, Creative Land Use Redevelopment. That's another EPA organization we're highly tied in with those guys uh they do a good job of helping you know grant writing and whatnot if we need okay. more funds so that's awesome very cool we'll make sure to to follow up with you and see how we can you know collaborate and just learn more sure because um you know the grant writing aspect i understand it to be very technical <laughs> and um always something to to learn more about so that would be fantastic thank you Welcome. So, there you know, other questions? I think we can move on to our next steps. So, for our next steps, you know, we're a back that meets um, biannually, so we more than likely won't be meeting until around the September um, timeframe of this year. That's good six months from now. But in the interim, into our next meeting, we're probably going to be sending you a few things. Uh, one being a FTP site link that we were hoping to use for data sharing, uh, document sharing, file sharing, so to say. So we're going, we already have the FTP link um, set up. We're going to probably email that to you so you can get a chance to access it. Just let us know that you have access to it. Uh, we're going to be using that to share different documents with you as the program progresses. Um, so we can all just always be abreast of what the program is doing and the different documents, materials that are going, on, going out, as well as the kind of um, public outreach activities we're going to want to host. Um, so you want to use that tool to kind of stay abreast of these events and the different activities that are launched by the coalition city cities for the program. Like I said, we're working on developing our public engagement activity schedule. So we'll want to um, be active as much as possible and to let you all know when we're being active so you can let your people know who you're involved with that we're trying to be engaged in the community. Um, also, you can take a chance to review our website. If you have any kind of initial feedback on it, feel free to do so now in these early stages of the program so we can add any changes or edits that you think may be helpful for the successful uh, facilitation of the project. I mean, I'm sorry, the program. Um, also, you know, we've been able to use the FTP site and email you some, some um, educational materials and so forth. So just continue to review the information that we send out to you um, as you see fit and then begin continuing or begin considering the different you know, properties within your communities that you can kind of forward to us um, that we can begin to investigate as potential brownfield projects and also those persons in your communities that you think should be involved um, and made aware of what we're doing. So they have a, a opportunity to, to engage. Does anyone have any, any comments or questions on these next steps? Yes. Me again. Hey, who should we contact? Uh, would it be you or Luis uh, to set up uh, for you guys to come out and speak to our various groups? You can email me, I think on the next slide. And I will be able to provide you all with these slides. Um, it's my contact information as well as Louise's, but I am the main you know, public engagement person on the project. So feel free to email or call me anytime. Yeah, we're trying to, as far as like uh, work affecting the staff, I'm taking care of mostly the administration work. I'm working with uh, the Charles and the rest of the consultant team 
signing task orders and making sure that everything's doing correctly. So anything of public outreach goes directly to Daphne first, and I'm going to be her backup. Where are you guys located? Uh, do you have a, and where is your office? 445 North Garland Avenue in Orlando, Florida is the Lynx building. We are on the fourth floor. So if you ever uh, come to visit us, uh, let us know in advance because you won't be able to back, get past the lobby. <laughs> we'll have to come pick you up. And at some point, we hope that we're gonna be able to have a live meeting. It's just that this is a big region and people are very busy right now. So that's why we basically decided to uh, host this for the first one in Zoom. But I guess maybe September we'll be reevaluating whether we're going to do a live meet or not. A girl can dream. That's definitely my dream to see you all in person. So um, we did think about that, you all being kind of far away, just having our first meeting online. But, um, you know, this is a three year project. And we hope to have more meetings in the future. I think this has been a very successful first meeting, a very successful kickoff. And I want to, you know, follow up and say thank you all for your time. Thank you for your commitment on this, um, on this Brownfield Advisory Committee. And I'm looking forward to more meetings. So I'm definitely going to make sure you all get these slides, get our contact info. I'll also make sure to forward give the contact info for the coalition city leads so you are aware of who they are and um, how to reach out to them. I think I see someone's hands raised. I didn't want to leave. Well, yeah, that was that was Mon. I have one particular question. Um, in regards to the process as a whole with the Browns bill. The questions that. Oh, I don't know if it's me. Is there an issue with you, Daphne? Can everybody hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Lewis. Okay, so just ask me because I think with Daphne would be having issues. So you were asking specifically about the process? Yeah, so um, I know if I look at the uh, diagram that was up earlier, it's oh, basically yeah. like uh, from an assessment standpoint that you have to have the, with the property owner's um, participation in the program. Yes. But my question is in regards to from a city perspective, you have properties that have not been maintained, may have been through a code enforcement um, situation to where there has not been any movement from the property owner. However, one of these sites can clearly be, you know, designated or used for Brownsville um, that I'm thinking about in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, what what can be done from the government side of thing? Would they have to bait the property to go in and go into the Brownfields if you're not having cooperation from the the property owner, or let's say the property owner has been deceased, you know, what would be the process in bringing that property into compliance along with, you know, trying to move the city, I mean, help the city out from an economic standpoint, where you have all these dormant sites with, with just pretty much blight. So yeah. I didn't know, if, you know, do, do you always have to have participation from the property, I mean, property owner or the government will have to take over the property to move through that process? Yeah, the issue will be, and Charles can uh, talk about this more, if we don't have like uh, somebody giving us access to the property, uh, it's gonna be very hard for to do any type of assessment because we cannot go into private property. I think there might be opportunities to sort of work with the city and sort of try to identify who those property are, property owners are. And this is what happened kind of with the dry cleaner in Kissimmee when they didn't want to participate. It's like, hey, it was a priority side, we couldn't do anything. We can only encourage people. Uh, we had a, right now we have a, one of our biggest sites in Apopka who's gonna go, it's gonna go on a phase two. I think the, one of the owners is deceased and he's like a wife, the widow is kind of working with a consultant and that's how we're able to get permission to go in. It's definitely, but without any sort of like permission for property owner, it will be very difficult. We can certainly try to encourage it and have uh, Charles or our staff talk to the property owner, but I just don't see how we can get around that problem because I do think that 
light is certainly a problem, especially in our old downtown districts. And you have a lot of owners there that definitely are absentee landlords. And that's definitely a problem. So maybe, you know, and I don't, this is where it goes, because I'm not really a lawyer. I don't know if when, when court enforcement goes in, if that's a way to kind of like help the property owner, I wouldn't say comply, but just cooperate a little more. And again, this is a free service. Charles, how have you done this in the past? Well, you know, number one, uh, the Brownfields program is not an enforcement program. Uh, it's strictly on a volunteer basis that a property owner um, can, you know, request to have their site assessed. And even when the site is assessed and there may be a determination that there may be an environmental impact after a phase one is still in a situation where it's the property owner's choice, what's the next step? And, um, and I, 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 at this point, I think it's, it has to be something very exceptional that um, the EPA or, or, or the, the state would come in and uh, would want to do something uh, beyond that property owner just, you know, having the ability and control over whether anything happens to that property. But the Brownfields program definitely like for you to emphasize, uh, I would like to emphasize, it's not an enforcement program. It's strictly on a volunteer basis for the property owner to have an assessment done and then what they do after an assessment. Brian, do you have any experience like uh, with uh, areas that have like actually struggle with getting uh, compliance from landlords? Uh, yes, in kind of a roundabout way, but Charles just said exactly what I would say is that um, there are a little bit of requirements on the kind of sites that we can address, but as Charles was saying, the way the grant works, it's pretty much a voluntary process. It, uh, it's not going to be the best option for dealing with um, abandoned landlords if they're just totally out of the picture. Uh, so I guess, I guess that's what I'll say about that. Now, if, if, if the government's already taken actions to foreclose because of back taxes or uh, anything like that, those are, um, you know, a lot of times we'll do the phase ones on, on that kind of site because it, obviously at that point, the, the party that's now owning the property may not have a full and complete site history. So if that's already been done, uh, those are the kind of sites that, that we can definitely look at with the grant. But as far as initiating those actions, um, that that's kind of outside of the scope of the grant, I would say. Yeah, I wasn't really meaning to initiate the action, but a lot of these blighted sites in particular have been that way for 10 plus years. And, you know, code enforcement had, may have been finding them, but, you know, they're still sitting there. And then if a person's dead, you know, it just kind of lingers forever. So that's why I just kind of figure out if, you know, for example, let's say the city went through, did a pro probate, I mean, not probate, but abatement. And sometimes you, you got to clean up the site, you know, could it be used in conjunction with this brownfields to help the city absorb some of that cost? It's kind of why I was trying to figure out, you know, connecting the dots to get it to the point where now it's the site that can be advertised to say, hey, it's ready for re redevelopment or whatever that use may be. Roger, having, having been an economic de development person for the city of St. Petersburg for a number of years prior to uh, joining PPM, um, we were, you, you run across those, those kind of properties where uh, the owners uh, no longer exist and family members I have not done anything with it and a lot of code violations are stacking up. My approach was to um, be proactive and, and develop the liens and then with enough liens, get control of the property uh, from, the, uh, from a county standpoint uh, because the 
the taxes haven't been paid, and then uh, see if strategically, if it's in the city's best interest to go ahead and um, do the foreclosure because of the taxes and then take the property and, and clean it up or do what is necessary or in the best interest of the citizens in the city. But that's the only process that you can go through uh, to take uh, ownership of privately owned property. Okay. But as, and as long as they, they pay the taxes, um, then the county is in a position that they're paying the taxes, that the obligation they have with the, uh, the county. Well, let me ask you this, um, Lewis. Um, the 12 that's in the pocket, do we talk with Shakinia about that or do you guys have that list? Uh, for what specifically? For the sites, you mean? or? Yeah, for the sites in the pocket. Uh, usually, the way we've been working, um, we, uh, we anything that's go through a polka, I'll rather coordinate Shakinia because she's our contact for the city. So if you contact her first, and then she will relate to us and to Charles what uh, we have been, uh, where we need to go. So far, and Charles, you can correct me, I think that a lot of the outreach has actually uh, been uh, informally through the city, right? For some of the sites we're currently working on in the pop cup. Right, that's right. correct. Yeah, Kenya's so, online. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, um, I have a list. I know of all the sites that have submitted um, site agreements. Um, a lot of the sites that we have um, currently are city owned property, um, but we have worked with a few um, owners. Um, like you mentioned that one property, that's our, our Gator Growers property here in Apopka, um, where one of the owners just recently passed away. Um, but yes, I have the list that you guys can can uh, look over. Yeah, and I think she should be, uh, your city contact should be, uh, unless it's something related to the back, I think you should, like if you're gonna even contact us, I think it's a good idea to let your city contact know that, uh, that you have a specific property because that's why uh, we have, we have each, of, uh, each one of them in the cities. So they can actually provide us like uh, with good feedback. And again, okay. you all know the cities better than we do. All right, I'm back on despite technical issues I was facing earlier. I'm scared to share my screen for my connection. Sometimes this does happen with my connection. Um, I'm happy that I ended at the end of the meeting and um, Rogers, I hope your that your question was answered. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Hearing none, I think that this is a good time to go ahead and adjourn. Uh, apologies for going over a little bit, but obviously we we've had a great discussion, a very rich conversation, and I'm happy to see that. And um, I'm going to be planning our next meeting sometimes toward the end of the year. So you can all look out for that and other things that are coming out of the program. And again, if you have ideas for sites or persons to engage into this process, feel free to um, engage your coalition city kind of lead or reach out to us directly. Um, Daphne, one last um, pitch. Um, the Florida Brown, Florida, Alabama Brownfields uh, conference is coming up shortly um, in Pensacola. And so that would be an opportunity to interact both with local governments and persons from um, the state of Florida uh, um, and get information through the workshops. And then um, I know uh, Brian would pitch the national conference that's coming up uh, later on in the year, which again is a, a grand opportunity to have a uh, 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 more in depth and in in a broad understanding of brownfields throughout the country. So um, it's it's a continuing education. So I encourage uh, participation in both the uh, 
if not one, uh, uh, um, both um, to get a, a broad understanding of from constituencies such, such as yourself and local governments and from the national about what's going on with brownfields around the country that can better help your local community. Uh, and Charles, are there scholarships? Say it again, Luis. Are there scholarships for people um, to attend? Yeah, they're, they're, if you go online, um, there's mentioning of scholarships both for the local one and uh, the national. And I'd like for Brian to speak on that as well. Yeah, there usually are scholarships available. Um, I confess I haven't looked at the, uh, the details of this conference, um, but I can, I can send everyone the link, link to that. And I'm actually not even sure registration is open yet, so. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think it is just yet, but probably a good time to check on that. But yeah, I'll send. I'll send. It. Actually, let me see if I can do it in the link here, and then I can That'd email be great. everyone. Awesome. Yeah, Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Charles, for for mentioning that as well. Yeah. Um, what well, one person that knows about getting um, scholarships is uh, Shakenya, so uh, she can let you know uh, her past experience in being able to attend the conference. Correct. All right, thank you guys so much. I think um, if Brian does send that link and, and Charles is able to give more information, I'll make sure to forward that all to you all. Um, and we can all go from there. But thank you again. I think this is a good time to adjourn. Um, I hope you all have a great rest of your day and I'm looking forward to our, our next meeting. Oh, Brian just put in that link. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, and it looks like registration is not open. Okay. So that'd be a good way to learn about registration when it does come up. Um, so thank you. Thank you all for that. Thank you for your, your feedback today. Thank you again. It was a successful kickoff meeting. And I'm excited for the direction that this back is going to go in. So you're all free to go. And I hope you all have a great rest of your day, despite this weather. Thank all you. Right, thank you. you.